sermon outline. And uh, you can follow along this morning and you can fill in that outline. But perhaps if I go too fast or you miss some of the points, you can also go to our website and the outline is there already filled in for you. And so you can download that and not miss anything you might miss here this morning. For our scripture in John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, once again, let me share with you what Jesus is expressing to our hearts this morning. For the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way, for God is spirit. So those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, over the next five Sundays, we'll be discovering the core values of Turnpike Wesleyan. And we entitled this series, Getting to Know Us. There are five core values that we hold dearly to, and we're going to deal with the first one today, which is worship, which is a perfect one because it'll lead us right into our time of communion. Jim Kennedy sent me an article last week written by Max Wicano on worship. Here's what Max says. He sums it up this way. Worship adjusts us. It lowers the chin of the haughty and straightens the back of the burden. It bows the knees, singing to him our praise. It opens our hearts, offering to him our uniqueness. Worship properly positions the worshiper and oh, how we need it. We walk through this life so bent out of shape. Cure any flare-up of commonness by setting your eyes on the uncommon king. Worship lifts our eyes and sets them on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits at God's right hand in the place of honor and power. And that last expression that Max Michael uses is from Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. We need worship, no. We need to gather together to worship Him. When our need runs a distant second to the thoroughbred reason why worship is given to us by our Heavenly Father. Because God Himself deserves our worship. God would die for your sin before He would ever let you die in your sin. Isn't that amazing? We have such a wonderful Savior, and if that is the Savior that you hold dear to, don't you want to lift up your gift of worship? Wouldn't that just be a natural expression to the God who has given himself for you? However, if I were to ask a hundred people to give me a definition of what worship is, I dare say I would get a hundred different interpretations. Would you agree? Probably if I even asked you folks, and I kind of pooled the congregation here, you all would come up with your own idea of what worship is. And a lot of times it's because of our backgrounds or perhaps other experiences that we've encountered in our lives. But I would think that a good wide range of views would be the never-ending list of worship misconceptions. And we're going to talk about them here this morning. In fact, you know, if I gave you guys all styrofoam stones, there's probably points in the message you're throwing at me. And I go with styrofoam so they would hurt so much. But we're going to be looking at some gulp moments and some ooh, ah moments as we walk through this message together. Some of the misconceptions, in fact, the biggest is the notion that worship is all about us. It's all for us. Then when I go to worship, Boy, there's going to be something in it for me. Because if there's not, then I'm going to be sorely disappointed. Now, let me kind of clarify that. If you are truly in the house of God, if you're in a place where the word of God is being preached, and everything is centered around Jesus Christ, and they want the Holy Spirit to move in their midst, there are things that you will gather from worship. Your spirit will be lifted. You'll walk out of here saying, Ah, I have been with Jesus. But worship in itself is about Him. It's about us coming and presenting ourselves to the living God. We will get something out of worship if we come with that attitude, but that is a byproduct of true worship, not the function of worship. 
Another misconception is the notion that if I do a set of religious activities during worship, then I have worshipped. I think this was one of the misconceptions that the children of Israel were caught into. In fact, the Lord spoke to Malachi in Malachi 1.10 these words. Oh, that someone would shut the temple doors. You know what God's saying? Just close up the church. Close up the doors. So my people would not use lightly fires on the altar. In other words, he was saying, my people are coming and they have no idea where they're there. They're just going through religious motions and emotions, but they're really not expressing their love for me. And he goes on to say, I'm not pleased with you, says the Almighty Lord. I will accept no offering from your hands. So some of the misconceptions is that if we do certain activities, we worship, or worship is about us, and we need to put them aside this morning. But you know, those contributing factors often fall in line with the fact that we have maybe wrong expectations of worship. Some expect an intellectual stimulus when they come to worship. And for those who are regular attenders here, I praise you for coming because you know you're never going to get that intellectual <laughs> stimulus for the guy standing behind this pole. <laughs> so I thank you that you come Sunday after Sunday. In fact, I will even go on record to say this. Every Sunday afternoon, I load up the message uh, to the website. And I have to listen just briefly to make sure that the message loaded properly. I can't stand my own voice. <laughs> and you guys still come Sunday after Sunday. So I give you kudos for that. I know you're not here for the intellect. I know you're not here to listen to the pastor and his stuffy nose and the allergies that affect him. But you know, people do come just for that stimulus. And if they get it, they feel, oh, I worshiped. And if they don't get it, they feel, oh, that was no good. There was no worship today. Some, and I will say this, this is a problem facing our churches today. And, and it's a sad thing to me, to my own heart. But some expect a form of entertainment. Now, they're not going to say that, but they want the smoke, they want all the activities, the flashing lights happening on a Sunday morning. And if that happens, if the fog machines are working properly and everything falls into place on the platform and it feels like they're at a concert and the lights are in the right position, they say, ah, that was worship. We worship today. And again, I thank each of you because you know some Sundays nothing works right. <laughs> we have problems with the tech. We have problems with the PowerPoint. We have problems with the sound system. We have problems with the preacher. Sometimes things just don't happen the way we plan. But you still feel like you've worshipped. And you know, there are times that I feel I've messed up so bad in my preaching, I don't even want to go down there and meet you. I want to go out there and find a Snickers bar. <laughs> or Southwest, take me somewhere quick. But without fail, somebody will come up and shake my hand and say, Pastor, thank you. That's exactly what God needed to say in my heart today. I appreciate you folks as a congregation. And yes, I appreciate you coming and bearing with me this morning. And I give you the invitation to come back. But if we don't sense that we've been entertained on a Sunday morning, then we walk away feeling that worship didn't take place. You need to make sure you underscore this in your sermon notes. Worship is not about intellect. And worship is not about entertainment. It's all about an encounter with the living God. God wants to communicate with us. He wants to commune with us. He wants to reside in us. That is worship. In fact, worship is the outward expression of our inward relationship with the Heavenly Father. And if that relationship is absent, then no matter what we do, it's worthless. But if that relationship is present, then worship is worthy. It has meaning and purpose. In John chapter 4, the verses that we use this morning actually refers to the meaning of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. 
And she poses a question in verse 20 of that chapter. She says, my people have their place of worship on this mountain right behind me. You Jews go to your temple in Jerusalem. Now I've got a question. Which one is right? Well, have you ever heard that before? You guys are Wesleyan and we're Baptist, or you're Wesleyan and we're Methodist. What worship is right? I think countless churches today struggle with the same question. In fact, committees have been established, task force teams are appointed in an effort to discover which one is right. Which style of worship is right? I mean, the young people want contemporary. They want upbeat. They want something that's going to speak into their lives because of the, the, the lifestyle they have, the generation they're from. Older people, they want the 18th century hymns because those speak into their hearts. Those are testimonies that they can relate to. Well, for the young and the old here today, I should bite my lip, but I'll say it anyway. Worship is neither synthesizers nor 18th century hymns. They cannot produce general worship because genuine worship is when we invite the Holy Spirit to meet in our presence. And then it really doesn't matter if the songs are hymns or the contemporary songs. So let's take a look, since worship is our subject this morning, what true worship is. Jesus says it's really not a question of which one is right, whether on the mountain or in the temple. He says true worshipers are going to come to the realization they need to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. When Jesus makes this statement, he's teaching us some important things about worship. First of all, he's teaching us that a time is coming, in fact, it's right here now, in the very presence that we're living in, when worship will no longer be associated with a place. Can I hear an amen to that? Because oftentimes, we get caught up with a building, don't we? And I'm just as guilty as anybody else. In fact, what do we say? If somebody says, ah, where do you worship? Ah, oh, we worship at the Turnpike Wesleyan Church, and we invite you to come either 845 or 1030. And we know it's true because it's on the website, it's on Facebook, it's in the bulletin. So that's a fact. That's worship. Well, listen to what the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 619. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? Did you catch that? God doesn't reside in a building. He resides in you. He resides in your life. In fact, when we say God's in the house, actually, if you're a Christian and you came, yeah, God's in the house, because you brought him with you. He lives within you. And John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Not only do we have the Holy Spirit residing in us, we have a wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. In fact, the Word of God says his name is Emmanuel, God with us. The bottom line, God's presence, thus the place of worship, is no longer centered in the Temple of Jerusalem, or on the mountain that the Samaritans worship at, or even in a building we call Turnpike Wrestling. It's centered in the heart of every believer. If you go to church thinking you're going to a place of worship, then I guess we really don't understand what worship is. The church is a place of fellowship. It's a place where we gather together, we rally together. It's a place where we unite together as worship takes place. That's why church is important, and we're told in Hebrews not to forsake the assembly of ourselves. We need the encouragement of one another. But Tony Evans has said this, if you limit worship to where you are, the minute you leave that place of worship, you leave behind the worship. Just like a crumpled up old bulletin. In other words, if this is the only place we worship, when we walk out these doors, then what happens the rest of the week? No, worship needs to happen day in and day out. It's the expression 
outward expression of our inward relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to understand it. You can take worship with you this morning. In fact, I'm encouraging you, inviting you, after you leave this place, to take worship with you. Yes, it's going to be an awesome experience with God that we had this morning, but take that experience outside these doors so that people will know that you have been with Jesus. And then a time is coming, has now come, when worship will be done in spirit and in truth. What this means is that you do not measure worship by any level of entertainment. You don't measure worship by personal satisfaction. You don't measure worship by the level of your comfort. And we do want you to be comfortable when you come to worship services. But you notice that we don't have theater chairs and popcorn and soda. Because <laughs> we want you to focus on what really matters. This means that worship is not dependent on a place. It's not even dependent on the presence of certain people. It's determined by the presence of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit moves among us, worship is taking place. And the Holy Spirit is not determined by the bricks of a building, by the color of carpet, by a cross or a communion table, by the position of the pulpit, or whether a pulpit is even in place. It's not determined by the piano, the drums, the vibes, the cars, or the vocalist. And I need to say, wasn't that wonderful to see the whole praise team up here this morning? All of our vocalists and all of our instrumentals. Uh, what a beautiful sight that was. It's not determined by the pastor, but it's determined by the attitude and the heart of the worshiper. So if you walk away from a true worship experience where you know that God's word was preached and you know that it is a word-believing, Bible-based church, if you walk away saying with the psalmist, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, I would say you've experienced worship. But if you're in such a church, you walk away voicing criticism, why, why you didn't like this, why you didn't like that. Uh, it's fair to say you probably did not experience worship. And a lot of times if we measure worship about our own likes or dislikes, we hold the same position as a Samaritan woman. You know, my preference is here on the mountain. I don't know about the Jews who go down there and worship in that temple. Or how about the Pharisees? Didn't they make worship almost a mockery? They made worship a business by selling right in front of the church doors? Or how about the people of Malachi's day where the Lord said, just shut the doors. They don't understand worship. They have no clue what they're coming here for. The Lord is saying, a day is coming. It has now arrived when worship will be done in spirit and in truth. That's the kind of worshipers God is looking for. That's why it's a core value of Turnpike Wesleyan Church. We want our worship to be genuine. One of the things I've shared in the past, our praise team up here are not performers. They do not want to perform. What they want to do is lead us all to a place of worship. Lead us all to where we can express our inward relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, I'm going to ask uh, Lisa to come back to the piano. You know, there's a reason the temple curtain was torn from the top to the bottom when Jesus was crucified. Because it changed worship forever. Worship would no longer be associated with a place. More importantly, worship would be a personal encounter with my spirit and the spirit of God in close communion. And this morning, we have a chance to close this part of our worship service by communing with the Lord through the Lord's Supper. So I ask Pastor Judy to give me a hand this morning as we prepare the communion table. I also need to mention that when we take communion, it is an open communion. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we welcome you to the communion table. You don't have to be a member of Turnpike Wesleyan Church. You don't have to be a member of the Wesleyan denomination. If you love Jesus, we want you. In fact, we invite you to come to the Lord's table. So these are the price off to what we get to take.
table ready. And the way we're going to do communion, we're going to stand together, starting with those in the back. They'll come down the center aisle, receive both elements, the bread and the juice. Make your way back to your seat using the side aisles. And after everyone has received,